Hope 2020. We're on our next session today. We have Tom Pereira and his son, Dan. And we're going to be talking about the Enigma machine. The title of this session is called Hacking Enigma, the real story of the imitation game and Alan Turing. And uh, we'll be available for Q&A in the Matrix chat and also right after the movie. So we'll see you in just a little while. Uh, stay tuned. Thank you very much. Hacking Enigma, the real story of the imitation game with Professor Tom Pereira and Dan Pereira. Enigma Museum has been the only organization in the world that hunts for, researches, restores, and provides fully restored and working Enigma cipher machines to museums, historians, and collectors for over 40 years. Enigma Museum found and restored the enigmas that appear in the imitation game and Snowden. Enigmamuseum.com also maintains the only list of surviving Enigma machines of the approximately 23,000 German Army and Air Force Enigmas, only 289 are known to have survived and only 84 of the approximately 8,000 German Navy Enigmas have survived. Calling upon our many years of Enigma research, we're going to tell you how the Enigma works, how and by whom its codes were broken, and the real story behind the imitation game. We will end our talk with a description of the greatest intelligence coup in world history. <coughs> All branches of the German military used Enigma machines to hide and encrypt their communications. Starting way, way before the beginning of World War II in 1939, in about nine, in the early 1930s, the Germans started building up their military illegally, and they had to hide this. So they used the Enigma machine for that. And then they continued using the Enigma machine throughout World War II to hide and encrypt their communications. The Enigma machine was initially patented by the German inventor, Arthur Scherbius. Other people had invented the Enigma machine, but he was the first to patent it. The others were similar, but without the patent, they could not go forward. He did this in 1918, and his first Enigma failed to sell. It was this horrible, huge, 300-pound, cumbersome device that he hoped would be appealing to corporations for their personal internal corporate security. Uh, finally, in 1922, he developed a more portable version, uh, and this version he offered to the United States, to Europe, to the Germans. Nobody was very interested in it. A couple of pe people bought a few out of curiosity, but it was not until the early 1930s when the German military started to build up its, uh, its forces that the Enigma machine was taken over by the Germans and all production then went into the German military until 1945, at which point the Enigma machine was no longer produced after the end of the war. The Enigma machine is a very simple device. This is a coding Enigma machine, which means it is designed to take a plain text letter, such as the letter A, and encode it into a secret cipher text letter, such as the letter H. It does that by typing in, when you type in the letter A into the keyboard, it closes a very simple electrical circuit, very much like that of a flashlight, and the result is that it lights up a light bulb under the letter H and illuminates the letter H. So the plain text letter A typed into the keyboard produces a cipher text or secret version of A, which is the letter H. The way it does this is relatively simple. The machine is very simple. There are only a total of 80 wires inside the entire Enigma machine, and we'll learn a little bit about what they do in a moment. 
Um, the substitution code, where you take a plain text letter and change it into a cipher text, uh, started out way before Julius Caesar, but it has been given the Julius Caesar name called the Caesar Code, where you take a plain text alphabet, just a normal alphabet, and a second alphabet, which is of the same alphabet, and you then slide the second alphabet over by a given number of letters so that the plain text letter now has an equivalent cipher text letter. You can then convert any plain text letter like the letter E into a cipher text letter like the letter L. This technique was also used during the American Civil War. This is an American Confederate States of America code wheel. And if you wanted to encode the letter A at the top of the wheel here into a secret version of A, a ciphertext version, uh, you simply take this rotating center wheel and adjust it to what you would call the day's key or the initial key setting. And then you can convert any plain text letter on the outer ring into a ciphertext letter on the inner ring. If you take that ciphertext letter or a word consisting of those ciphertext letters over to another code wheel, and if that code wheel is set to the same day's key or initial setting, then you can decode the message by simply looking at the coded letter on the inner wheel here and finding out what the equivalent plain text letter is on the outer wheel. The Enigma machine does essentially the same thing. You type in a letter A, it has changed the alphabet around, and it wiring arranges so that a light bulb lights up under the letter H. Let's look at the circuit and see how it does that. It's a very simple circuit. We start out with a battery over here on the right, and we take the battery voltage and pass it through the normally open contacts of the letter A keyboard key. This carries the voltage over to a plug board on the front of the Enigma, which changes the letter A then over to a letter O. The plug board wire then goes into a set of three rotating rotors by way of an entry drum, and these rotors convert the entry letter O into a number of other letters, and at the left end, there is a wired reflector that forces the voltage to come back out through these rotors again. And after all these conversions, it comes out as the letter M. Letter M goes to the plug board on the front of the Enigma and is converted over to the letter H by jumper wires on this plug board. And then the letter H is carried electrically through the normally closed contacts of the H key, and this illuminates the H light bulb. So basically, we see it's a flashlight with a battery, a switch, and a light bulb. And the only thing that's complicated is this circuit consisting of a number of rotating rotors and the settings of the plug board on the front of the Enigma. Here's an Enigma machine. We type the letter A into the keyboard, and we note that the letter H lights up on the light bulb panel. The letter H then is written down and it's either sent by messenger or telephone or sent by radio over to a decoding enigma. And that decoding enigma must be set the same way at the same starting position as the coding enigma. And here we have a decoding enigma. And in this decoding enigma, we're gonna type in the ciphertext letter H and we're going to see it converted back into the original plain text letter A. So we type the letter H on the keyboard and the Enigma internal wiring lights up the A on the plug board on the light bulb panel. The critical thing is that this decoding Enigma must be set to the same initial starting key as the um, encoding Enigma and that means it has the same internal wiring. Let's go through that wiring again. We see we go through exactly the same wiring, but backwards. In this case, we press the letter H key, and the battery in the lower right here 
voltage is connected to the plug board on the front of the Enigma, where it's jumpered over to the letter M. The M enters the stack of rotors, goes through the stack of rotors to a reflector on the left, back through the rotors, and back out of the stack of rotors as the letter O. The letter O is then connected over to the letter A on the plug board, and finally the voltage goes up through the normally closed contacts of the A key and lights up the A on the uh, enigma. So we have then a coding enigma and a decoding enigma. The coding enigma, as we've seen, if we type in the letter A, it lights up the H light bulb. The H is then transformed over or carried over to a second enigma and typed into its keyboard. And when the H is typed into the keyboard, the letter A lights up on the light bulb. And we have now taken the letter A plain text, coded into a ciphertext letter H, and then decoded it back into the letter A again. Looking at a slightly more complete diagram of the Enigma lets us see in slightly more detail what's going on. The battery over on the right here produces a voltage which sits on the normally open contacts of all of the keyboard contact, contacts. And when a key is pressed, such as the letter A, the contact is connected and it carries the voltage to a pin on the plug board panel on the front of the Enigma, in this case, the letter A. The letter A is then converted by the plug board over to the letter M. The M goes through a set of wires into the right side of the rotor stack. And here we can see the rotor stack a little more clearly. We see that we enter the right-hand rotor as an M. We come out as a B. We enter the um, left the middle rotor as a B and come out as a J. We enter the uh, reflector at uh, the left rotor as a J and we come out into the reflector as an F, out of the reflector as a P, and out of the left rotor as an N, and out of the middle rotor as an X, and out of the right rotor as an O, and we eventually find our way down to the plug board letter O, where this is jumpered over to the letter H, and the H is carried through the normally closed contacts of the H key, and it gets back to the battery and illuminates the letter H. So the wiring is, again, very simple, just a switch, a battery, and a light bulb. But the real complication comes in with respect to the rotors up here, the rotors themselves. And they change every single time you type in a letter. Every time you type in a letter on the keyboard, the rotors turn one step. It's like the odometer on a car. The right-hand rotor steps once. When it's gone 26 times, it steps the middle rotor. When the middle rotor steps 26 times, it steps the left rotor. Every time they step, it changes the internal wiring of the Enigma. So let's see what happens. Here's a coding Enigma, our very same old coding Enigma, but we've now typed in the letter A a second time on the keyboard. And because the rotor has rotated, the letter X is now the coded version of the letter A. And so if we were to look at our set of coding and decoding enigmas, we are now typing in the letter A a second time. The letter X lights up on the light bulb panel of the coding enigma. That's the coded version of the letter A second time. We then type the letter X into the decoding enigma, which has already decoded once. It's now on its second decoding job, and therefore it's exactly identical in its wiring to the encoding enigma. And we type in the letter X, and we get back the letter A, the second letter A. So it's a very simple setup. The thing that is very interesting, however, is that there are a number of different possible settings of the Enigma that, that uh, determine what the day's key is that is used. The day's key involves a number of internal adjustments of the Enigma. The rotor number and position along the axle. You can have any one of five rotors and put them in any of these three places in any order. And that is 60 possibilities. 
the each rotor has an internal ring setting, uh, actually 26 ring settings, and that gives you 676 possible settings. Each rotor has an initial starting position that you can see through the little windows on the Enigma. There's 17,576 of these, and the jumper cable selections on the plug board, there are five times 10 to the 15th power, big number of possible settings of the plug board, which can have anywhere from zero to 13 different cables in there. So those settings combine, and when you add those all together and figure out what the total number of possible days key settings for an Enigma is, it comes out to a staggering number of 10 to the 114th power possible individual days keys settings. That doesn't look like a huge number, just a few little symbols over here, but if you compare it to the total number of atoms in the observable universe, we find that there are only 10 to the 80th atoms in the entire observable universe. And we compare that to the 10 to the 114th power possible days keys of an enigma. We realize that the enigma has a very complex initial possible number of settings. The settings or days key are given in a code book that looks like this. On the left, we have the days of the month going from day one to day 31. Then we see the type of reflector that's in there. Then we see the number of the rotors and the order of the rotors. In this case, the leftmost rotor is a, no, a rotor four, the middle rotor is a two, and the rightmost one is the number one rotor out of a possible five different kinds of rotors. The next column gives us the ring settings for each rotor, uh, anywhere from 1 to 26 for each of the rotors. The left is set to 16, middle 22, and right most rotor to 8. The next set of columns tells us where the plug board settings are uh, installed. In this case, A is jumpered over to M, C is jumper to P, D to J, E to Z, and so on. And that changes, as you can see, with every day of the month. And finally, on the right are, is a way of calculating which of the uh, letters is visible through the window as the starting position of those letters. The uh, head of the U-boat command, Admiral Carl Dernitz, knew that his Enigma machines could have 10 to the 114th power possible settings, and therefore he felt very confident <clears throat> that nobody would ever be able to guess at a particular day's key setting. Even though he knew that it might be possible for someone to capture a code book, that would only give them the settings for one month. And that's highly unlikely because every code book was closely, very carefully guarded when it was delivered to the individual Enigma installation. Therefore, <clears throat> Admiral Dönitz com uh, communicated with every one of his submarines every single day, and he demanded demanded that every submarine send back to him their latitude and longitude position every single day throughout the war, having no clue that the Allies were going to be able to decode those messages and know where every one of his submarines was located. He knew the Allies would, could intercept the messages because they're just radio messages, but he was certain they would never be able to decode his signals. His U-boats were a tremendous danger. They stood the possibility of completely isolating Britain from the rest of the world and uh, Europe from the rest of the world and Churchill considered that the U-boats were the greatest danger in World War II, and they were doing terrible things. They were sinking a tremendous number of ships. Okay, and now we get to the imitation game. Along comes Alan Turing to the rescue, and he goes running across the field yelling, Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! That's the answer! And everybody looks over his shoulder as he finally decodes, figures out how to decode an Enigma message. 
Unfortunately, this is totally untrue, as we'll say in a minute. The only good thing about this picture from our standpoint is that that is the enigma that we were able to find and restore that was being used in the movie. But Alan Turing was not the first person to decode the enigma and or even use the concept of a common phrase in an enigma message. In addition, we see him in this picture with the bomb, the Enigma decoding a device that he supposedly built and designed to decipher the Enigma. And unfortunately, sorry Alan, he did not do that. What is the true story of the deciphering of the Enigma? Well, it boils down to three brilliant Polish mathematicians who broke the Enigma codes and built the first bombs six years before the war started, six years before Turing and Bletchley Park had anything to do with deciphering the Enigma machines. Uh, Poland uh, was sandwiched between two parts of Germany by the Treaty of Versailles, and they knew they were going to be attacked by the Germans. So they developed a technique for cracking the Enigma code by taking their top mathematicians, led by Marian Rievsky on the right, Henry Zygalski and Jerzy Roizicki, and uh, they were able to calculate the German military enigma wiring. And we'll see what that means in a moment, as early as 1932. And they built the first enigma deciphering bombs and were able to successfully decipher the enigma messages for six years before the war started. Here is an enigma rotor, and nobody knew how the rotor input pins on the right were wired over to the output pins on the left. This is called the rotor wiring maze. And it was up to the three Polish mathematicians and they figured out mathematically the wiring maze for all of the five different rotors that were used in the Enigma machine. They then went about building their own Enigma machines to help them in decoding Enigmas. This is a Polish built Enigma machine. And they designed devices to decode the Enigma, which they called bombs. The first one on the left here is called a cyclometer and it's manually operated with three Enigma rotors here and three over here and comparison, electric comparisons and switches that indicated when there was a, a simultaneous reading between the rotors. Uh, on the right, they had put an electric motor in the bomb and uh, they used the bomb for deciphering the messages. No one knows really why they called them bombs. One thought is that the electric motor made a clicking sound like a time bomb. Another is that it's a name of the very a uh, popular Polish dessert. So it's not clear where that name came from. Here is a rebuild of the cyclometer. This is the first rebuild that's ever been done successfully. And it was done just this month, just in 2020. And here it is, a man at Cambridge University built a uh, replica of the cyclometer with Enigma rotors here, Enigma rotors over there. You can see you can take them out and change them around the way you can inside an Enigma machine. And that device was successful. Uh, in 1939, when Poland was invaded by Germany, the Poles grabbed their devices and their plans and they escaped by way of France to England. Here we see Poland being completely overrun by Germany. The Poles ran over to England and they gave their information, the Enigma replicas, the bomb plans to Bletchley Park where Alan Turing was heading the uh, group dedicated to deciphering the Enigma. And Alan Turing took their ideas and their techniques and their devices for deciphering the Enigma and used those as the basis for his own um, work on deciphering the Enigma. The unfortunate thing is that nobody ever gave the Poles credit. So it is not well known that the Poles were the ones who supplied Bletchley Park with the information and the models that allowed them to successfully decipher the Enigma. 
deciphered messages at Bletchley Park were codenamed ultra messages, and they were read in, in plain English and allowed the Allies to know what the Germans were doing throughout the war. 10,000 codebreakers kept their secret of what went on in Bletchley Park for 30 years, so nobody even knew what Bletchley Park had been doing. Alan Turing, of course, brilliant mathematician, led the efforts at Bletchley Park, and once they had the Polish techniques for uh, deciphering the enigma, he went ahead and expanded them and improved them, and he set about building his own bomb, and this is known as the Turing-Welchman bomb, in which, again, we see rotors, but these are uh, more complex rotors, and it's a huge machine, electrically operated, very similar in concept to the Polish machine, based on the Polish machine, but as you can see, a much more complex, much, much more complex machine. This is an amazing machine. If you ever get over to Bletchley Park, don't uh, miss having a look inside the Turing Welchman bomb. Um, the Americans also were building bombs. This is the U.S. Navy bomb made by the National Cash Register Company in Ohio and dedicated to cracking the Enigma code. The American code breaking uh, efforts were took place in Arlington Hall, which is near Washington, formerly a girls' school, and they were very successful. Um, Turing then um, realized that the Germans were getting into more complex coding devices, and he designed a, a device which he called Colossus, and this allowed very rapid reading of paper tape uh, Enigma encoded messages. They could go into the machine. It was the first to, the machine to use uh, thermionic tubes, uh, and it is considered by many people to be the initial version of the first programmable computer. Now let's look at that. Here's an NSA book called Cryptology's Role in the Early Development of Computer Capabilities in the United States. And what they're saying is the need to decipher Enigma messages acted as a stimulus for the development of many different devices that ultimately culminated in what we now think of as an electronic computer. The first of these was the Polish cyclometer that we've just discussed, and then the Polish bomb up here, the Turing-Welchman bomb over here, the British Colossus that Turing was involved with, the American uh, Enigma deciphering bomb, and then other computers evolved from that, including the Atlas back in 1954, and the RCA-501 in 1958. So the Enigma need to decipher the Enigma acted as a stimulus for all of these activities. What is a computer after all? Can we call any of these machines computer? A uh, computer is most often defined as a device that has an input, a central processing unit, and an output. Some li people like to add on it's got to be electronic or electrical or something, but the basis of a computer is that you take an input, you do an operation on that, and the computer gives you an output. The computer central processing unit is uh, open to argument. Most people consider that it must have a preset sequential number of operations, like uh, the chips in today's computer, they have pre-wired add, subtract, and carry kinds of operations, and it has to have a stored program. You have to be able to put a program into a computer, which will then direct the operations uh, to perform operations on an input. Um, our question is, have we overlooked the enigma itself? Thinking of the enigma as the stimulus, the catalyst for the development of a computer, what about the possibility that the enigma itself was a computer? After all, it has an input, its keyboard, it has an output, which is its display, the light bulb panel, and it has a basic form of CPU in which nine sequential operations are performed. Remember the nine conversions that we saw of uh, numbers and letters uh, on the inside the Enigma machine. Uh, those are fixed sequential operations, so those are the operation, nine operations of the CPU, and the stored program is the day's key. 
you uh, program the computer manually, and uh, that is the stored program. So I would like to posit the possibility that the Enigma itself was the first computer and not the machines that were developed in order to decipher it. If we go with that, then we can see the rather funny similarities between the Enigma. It looks sort of like a laptop. You have a keyboard and a display screen. There's a laptop. It looks a little like a notebook. You have the keyboard and the display screen like the old uh, Radio Shack 100. And it looks a little bit like a smartphone with its uh, keyboard and its display and its central processing unit. We'll leave that for people to argue about and move on to consider other things. Alan Turing's brilliant contributions to all of this were speeding up deciphering by designing these incredibly complicated additional devices and dealing with the German improvements by designing new bombs that were able to keep up with the German changes. Turing was helped by a number of things, the capture of code books themselves from U-boats occasionally, not a lot of them, but they helped a lot. Repeated predictable words in messages, Heil Hitler, and so on, and many other discoveries that you can read about uh, and how uh, the Enigma was decoded. Here's a picture of the U-boat U-505 being captured and boarded uh, with its code books being removed. And here is a picture of the U-505 being uh, towed. And you can actually go in U-505 in the Chicago Science Museum where it's sitting uh, in all its glory with its Enigma machines. Deciphering the German Enigma messages had to be hidden from the Germans. Uh, which sometimes required the sacrifice of lives. You couldn't let the Germans you knew where and let the Germans know that you knew where every one of their U-boats were, or they would have panicked and changed their enciphering devices. So they uh, uh, hid that in various ways, which you can read about. We don't have time to discuss. Enigma deciphering is generally believed to have shortened the war by two years, saved thousands of lives, and prevented Hitler from completing the atomic bomb. In the war, over 70% of all of the U-boats and 70% of the crew were sunk, mostly through Enigma deciphering, although it turns out that some Enigmas were sabotaged. The Germans were stupid enough to have prisoners of war wiring their Enigma machines, if you can imagine such a thing. Here's a, I don't have any pictures of them wiring Enigmas, but here's a picture of prisoners of war building BMW engines and prisoners of war building high-tech German rocket uh, guidance systems. And it is fairly clear that they also built Enigma machines. Uh, since most of the German workers were off being soldiers, they needed workers. Uh, we have found in taking apart many, many, many Enigmas, signs of sabotage that include a loose plug it had never been wired, so it didn't just fall in there inside the Enigma that blocked the operating bar of the Enigma to come down, a fish hook that was tucked into the wiring and gradually worked its way into and shorted out the wiring, and screws that were too long to properly crimp down the wires. None of these techniques could be obvious because the Enigma had to pass inspection to get out of the factory. But uh, these devices, these techniques allowed the Enigma to fail in the field. At the end of the war, uh, all of the Enigmas were ordered destroyed by Hitler. And here's a picture of the Germans destroying the last of the Enigmas. And Churchill also ordered the destruction of every Enigma and the bombs and plans for the bombs. We don't know why until finally we came across this very strange Enigma. It's an Enigma with a Hebrew keyboard of all things. It took us two years to figure out what was going on here. And it turned out that the British had actually not destroyed all of the Enigmas. They gave 30 of them to Israel and said, why don't you use these machines for your own internal security? They're really secure. They didn't bother telling Israel that uh, the machine had been cracked and that they were able to read the messages. Luckily, Israel 
converted them over to Hebrew keyboards, but never actually put them into service. Although other countries that, that Britain gave enigmas to did put them into service. It was sort of like a Trojan horse. Enigmas are very hard to find these days. Many, very few of them survived because they were all blown up. You find them occasionally on battlefields. If you dig in the mud, you can sometimes find them. Most of them were blown up and look like this horrible thing. And it's very unusual to find a complete enigma. General von Mantufel was cornered and he surrendered his entire uh, tank army to the Americans in order to avoid being captured by the Russians. And he buried his enigmas three feet down in the dirt uh, as he was being captured. And this one was found by a metal locator. It was gradually dug out. You can see the plug board coming out of the mud. And here is the Enigma machine itself. And here it is with a little of the mud cleaned off. And this Enigma obviously had been hit and damaged in addition to burying it. But the idea was uh, to try and destroy it completely. And that's why these things are so hard to find. Sometimes you can find them in lakes. If you go diving in lakes with metal detectors, here's the parts of an Enigma machine in a German lake, been badly damaged. As you can see, we studied the damage here and realized that it had been actually caused by the butt of a German rifle. And uh, here's a U-boat that was sunk off the South Carolina, North Carolina coast, U-352. When you go diving on this U-boat, it's sitting there in fairly deep water. And if you work your way into the radio room and grab the Enigma after about 75 years under salt water, it ends up looking like this. And this Enigma was actually restored back to working condition. So you get pretty desperate when you're looking for Enigma machines. <laughs> Every once in a while you find some nutcase who has uh, managed to keep an Enigma machine. This guy is rebuilding a Messerschmitt ME109 fighter in his garage and he needed a motor. And he called me up and he said, you wanna trade an Enigma machine for some money to buy a motor? I said, sure. And so we ended up with this Enigma machine. Here's our biggest find of Enigma machines. This man, it turns out, had three Enigma machines under a desk in his living room. And you can see one, two, three. The one with the arrow is actually the Enigma machine that appeared in the imitation game. So this is the moment at which we first saw the Enigma in the imitation game, a very exciting moment. We restored it, brought it back into working condition, and it was uh, used in the imitation game. Taking a quick look at some of the other cipher machines that were used by the Allies and by other countries, this is the most secure of cipher machines used by the American forces called the Sigaba. The British used a device called the Typex, very secure machine. The Japanese, as you probably know, used a purple machine. This is a purple analog built by the Americans to simulate the purple machine since no actual purple machine was ever recovered. During the Cold War, the Russians developed an Enigma-like machine, which they codenamed Fialka. It has 10 rotors, not just three, and these rotors rotate in different directions. So it's an amazingly complex machine. And we get to the American World War II M209 cipher machine, very simple machine, no electricity even, just purely mechanical, does a conversion. You put in the plain text letters on the left here, turn them, and it then prints out, you turn a, a, a lever on the right, and it then prints out the cipher text letters up on a piece of paper tape. The M209 cipher machine was developed in 1935, sort of in the middle of the Enigma machine. The yellow here shows the, the time of production of the Enigma. The Hagelin M209 was developed in 1935. And uh, down here we see World War II. And the Enigma production ended at the same time that World War II ended. But Hagelin's kept on being made all the way up to 2018. Not exactly this ma the exact machine, but Hagelin, the Hagelin company and uh, subsidiaries, Crypto AG, kept making this machine all the way up into uh, a year or two ago. 
and 125 different countries uh, actually took on these machines and bought them from Hagelin for their own security. Every time a diplomat would come to the United States uh, to a United Nations conference or a, a diplomatic conference, they would bring their similar to an M209 cipher machine with them and radio, have the coded messages radioed or telephoned back to their home country for information. So this was the primary device used by all of the political, all of the countries uh, in their communications. And what none of them knew, none of them knew, and that's why I call this the greatest crypto coup in all of history. None of them knew that uh, Hagelin had allowed a back door to be installed in every one of his machines and the CIA was able to read every single message that was ever encoded by any of the Hagelin machines. So we're very excited about that discovery. It's really just come out in the last year or two, and I believe it is an extraordinary discovery. Uh, with that, I just want to mention a couple of things. We are enigmamuseum.com. If you'd like to contact us, we're info at enigmamuseum.com. Our book, Inside Enigma, gives all of the details of what happens in an enigma. Our lectures and our conferences try to spread the word about new discoveries about the enigma. And thank you very much for your attention on this. I'm and Hello, and thanks again for joining us after that great video on the Enigma machine. There's uh, so much history. It was just so incredible to uh, watch the story and then also how you found uh, all the Enigma machines. Really great stuff. Uh, thank you very much for sharing, Tom. You bet. Happy right. to do it. So, it's, our, it's our fun and games. Right on. All right. I'm going to go right to the uh, questions. And the uh, first question that we have is uh, probably a technical support question. In the field, if a light bulb burns out or a failure of one of the machines, uh, what do they do to, to resolve it? Do they fix it or get a new one? Uh, it, it, there were uh, 10 spare light bulbs inside the cover of the machine. You can see them uh, right up in there at the top of the machine, and they could screw those in. The problem was that it messed up the message, and sometimes they had to resend the message. And resending a coded message is very dangerous because it makes it easier to, to decode the messages. That makes sense. Yeah. Wow. And then, That's uh, uh, interesting. There were means to service the machines in the field. Later models of the Enigma uh, had a, a test socket right in the machine where the operator could test all the light bulbs to, at the start of a, a given day uh, to assure that they were all working. Oh, interesting. So they really thinking ahead. Very good. Okay, our next question is, um, in your uh, movie, you mentioned that the Enigma machine, the uh, uh, Polish mathematicians broke the code in around 1932, and in 1939, uh, the Germans invaded Poland. Um, were the Poles aware that the Germans were coming because they had already broken the code, or just those three mathematicians? They, they definitely knew about the buildup. They knew about German plans to uh, invade. The problem was the Germans used uh, a technique called Blitzkrieg. And although the Poles were sort of ready for them, the Germans just came in with such a tremendously rapid attack that they were not able to deal with it. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, um, the next question is about uh, ZUSE, Z-U-S-E -E computers. And I guess uh, ZUSE computers were around the time of the Enigma. Do they have any play into the Enigma story? They have a very important part in the history of the development of computing. And uh, if I could just uh, mention, um, there are a lot of books on the history of uh, the development of computing. This one is particularly good, uh, The Universal History of Computing. But almost every history book on, that talks about the development of computers mentions the Zeus computer as one important cog in the developmental steps. Wow, fascinating. New history, I never knew. Okay. 
While I'm at it, just one more thing. This is a fabulous book on uh, Colossus and the development of the um, Enigma breaking machine at Bletchley Park. And it contains a tremendous amount of history as well, uh, written by Jack Copeland and others. Thank you for sharing, that's great. On um, the next question uh, is probably uh, for the mathematicians. Uh, uh, the person asks about uh, 10 to the 115th power of combinations for the plug board seems like it's way too large. Um, he thought that it might be smaller. Um, could this be larger than individual code wheels as a follow-up? Um, yes, the, uh, the NSA uh, publishes a book and you can get it free by just going to their website, nsa.gov, on the cryptological mathematics of the enigma. And that book explains how it gets to 10 to the 114th power. It is not 10 to the 114th power uh, easy settings. You have to go in, you'd have to switch the reflector. Uh, that number really comes uh, is the maximum number of settings if all of the factors are unknown. So from a practical, practical purpose, uh, the person who's asking that question is correct, uh, that the code breakers had less than 10 to the 114th power possibilities to deal with. Right. Okay. That was a good question. The next question is, uh, they would like to start a project or are there projects to decode Enigma code by modern computers? Yes, there are many, many um, people doing that. Uh, the, one of the favorite things for people is to build simulators. And uh, one of the favorite simulators is this wonderful little Arduino Enigma. And it works just like an Enigma using a simple Arduino. If you just Google Arduino Enigma, you can have a real Enigma machine using an Arduino for an incredibly low price. I think it gets 150 bucks for it, all programmed for you. And it accurately simulates and emulates every Enigma machine model that was ever designed. But aside from that, there are wow. uh, a number of people working um, every time, and that's very exciting, every time we discover a batch of undecoded messages, uh, people set about uh, different ways of using modern computers to decode those messages. And again, you can Google un Un, um, unsolved Enigma messages and see some of the projects that are underway. The first time it was done, it took a full year with a hundred computers in parallel processing. People, uh, what do they did? It distributed processing where people use their home computers all linked together and they were able to break, break one Enigma message in a full year with a hundred computers going. Now they develop better algorithms. Wow, that's an, that's an incredible story. What a bunch of processing power. Okay, uh, the next question is, uh, okay. Uh, you mentioned something about the Hagelin. Was the Hagelin uh, uh, stop being produced because of a back door or was there another reason? Um, I, I don't see the question. Can you clarify okay. it? All right, I guess it might be a misspelling. I'm gonna go over to- No, I can, I can talk about that for a second. Very important. The Hagel and machines were actually um, initially designed in 1935, but they were built in various forms all the way until 2018. And uh, early on, the CIA managed to arrange to have a back door in them. And these machines were used by 125 different countries, none of whom knew that every message they sent with these machines was capable of being read by the CIA. So it's a little bit like Churchill with his Trojan horse. So the Hagelin machines have a, an amazing history yes. Yes, uh, of uh, decoding. Trojan horse is definitely uh, the good word for it. So we have about three minutes left. I think we'll be able to get uh, one or two more questions. So the next question was, uh, does Poland do any cool cryptography or privacy stuff nowadays that we might not be aware of or is not widely reported? One of the things that the Poles are very concerned with is that they be recognized for what they did. And little by little, people are putting up statues and memorials to the uh, 
mathematicians who did the code breaking and we're in touch with many of the Poles and their major focus is raising awareness of what the Polish contributions were. There is some current cryptology going on there, but I'm not aware of it. I'm mainly focused on their attempt to find their proper place in the history of cryptography. Yes, uh, more power to them, they deserve it. All right, um, next question is, if all the enigmas had been destroyed, how did that person have three of them? Was he in the military? Did he sneak them home or he just never found them or he bought them from other people? Do you know how he acquired them? Uh, they were not all destroyed. What happened was that the Germans found out that Churchill had ordered every GI to destroy them. And some Germans actually grabbed them and took them home thinking, well, maybe they'll someday be valuable. And most of those Germans have died. And what we do actually is to try and find the few surviving enigmas. They're usually in a basement or an attic. The family thinks it's just an old typewriter. They sometimes even show up at uh, garage sales and flea markets. Um, that's how the few of them survive. They're, we keep the only list of surviving enigmas in the world and there are a 287 known enigmas that survived out of the 30,000 enigmas that were made during the war. Wow, 30,000, that's a lot of moving parts. Um, yeah. sure. Okay, we're out of time. I want to uh, thank you very much, Dan Ferrara and your son, uh, Tom Ferrara, I'm sorry, Tom Ferrara and your son, Dan Ferrara, thank you very much for sharing this great story about the Enigma machine with all of us here at uh, 2020 on behalf of the attendees and the volunteers and the staff of Hope 2021. Thank you very much for sharing this with us. Tom and thank Dan. you, Hope, for a great conference. Thank you for having us. Thank you.